Well, hey, and welcome back. You joined me at the tail end of last week's project where, I must admit, it didn't exactly go to plan. The plan was to convert a reciprocating saw into a power scraper and I made a real hash of it. If you didn't watch that video, the long short of it is, is that it's all centered around a really old method called precision scraping. And it's used to create, or at least recreate, extremely flat surfaces. So what you do is you take a known flat surface, such as in this instance a granite surface plate, which is made to within, say, a few microns across its whole surface, and then you cover it with a thin layer of an oil-based marking dye, such as Prussian blue. You then take the part which isn't flat, or at least you think isn't flat, and then you press it up against the surface plate. Now the areas that contact will obviously pick up that blue dye, and any low spots won't. And this will give you a good visual look at just how flat the part is. Now if you then need to make the part flat, you can then take a scraper and literally scrape away the high spots of material until you eventually end up with a part that's perfectly flat across an evenly spread out set of contact points. And in practice, all the blue points will create a very flat and usable surface. Now obviously there will be some low spots, but that's actually one of the benefits of scraping because we use those low spots to help trap and retain oil and that's really useful for when you have sliding surfaces such as a gib strip on a lathe. In fact, this is one of the big advantages of scraping over say using a surface grinder. Although in fairness, you can add dips in the surface of surface ground parts to also help it trap oil. And I believe this is a common method called flaking. The other big advantage to scraping is that it's just a relatively cheap process. You know, a surface grinder is easily five or six figures, whilst you only need a few hundred for scraping. And with it, you actually can get better results than you would get with a surface grinder. Although you are going to be limited by the materials that you can scrape. So that's mainly going to be cast iron, brass, bronze, and I believe at a stretch, mild steel. Now from memory, the surface plate was $150. The carbide scraper blade was about 20 and the handle and the Prussian blue was another 20. It's obviously a DIY job and it's not the most comfortable handle in the world, but I was still able to scrape the mill, the gibbs and the mill vise perfectly flat and parallel. The only real downside to all of this is that scraping tends to take quite a lot of effort and time to do. Which is why power scrapers are a thing. You know, from the videos that I've seen, they're easily doing the work 10 times faster than what can be done by hand. Which is great, except for the fact that A, they're very difficult to come by, and B, even a used one will run me about a thousand bucks. Which is why last week I tried my best to convert a cheap reciprocating saw into a basic power scraper. And that almost worked, except for a loose screw, which came loose, jammed the piston and the yoke, and it effectively blew apart the casting. In fairness though, it wasn't my greatest design in the world, so I said that I'd have a bit of a think about it, and then attempt this again. Now in that video, I had a few people reach out and ask whether a multi-tool would work as a suitable scraper. And you know, interestingly enough, I have tried this a few times in the past, using various scraper blades. And whilst it did seem to make some progress in harder cast iron grades, it seemed to do more scratching than anything else. Still though, I think it's a great starting place and I think it's definitely worth exploring and I would have explored it a little bit further in this video if it wasn't for a few people suggesting that I take a look at air tools. You know, I must admit that air tools are a really undervalued piece of equipment in my shop. Not that I don't have an air compressor, because I do. It's just one of those very cheap, very loud ones and I find it very difficult to film around, which is why I don't use it all that much. But even so, I do think it's worth taking a look at. So what I did is I went out to Bunnings and I bought a Ryobi air reciprocating saw. I always forget just how small air tools are compared to their electric equivalent. You know, there's no motor needed and I'm pretty sure there's going to be no need for a gearbox. As a result, the size and even the weight difference is just night and day. And for what it's worth, it was also a lot cheaper. You know, this was 65 versus 70. You know, I did get the previous one open box, but this is still a Ryobi one compared to the other one, which was a bottom of the barrel, you know, no name brand. The other big difference between this one and the one last week is that this takes much smaller blades and the stroke is also a lot smaller compared to the one last week. 
Ryobi says the stroke's only about 8mm, which is about half of the electric one, but even still, I want to get the stroke a little bit lower. So the first thing I'll do is I'll get it pulled apart, and then we can see exactly what we're dealing with. Thankfully, you know, like most air tools, they're pretty easy to pull apart. So the front housing comes off with three screws, and then everything just sort of falls out the front. Just be careful because the front part is holding back two large springs. And that is the saw now pulled apart. You know, like most air tools, there's almost nothing to them, which is more that can be said for the one that I pulled apart last week. And when I say saw, I mean it's not really a saw, is it? It's mostly just a double acting piston where you can attach a blade to the end. I mean, really, just looking at it, we have our double acting piston, which shoots backwards and forwards, creating our backwards and forwards momentum. And then at each end, we have our springs. I mean, it doesn't get any simpler than that. The only real questions now are how do I reduce the stroke length, how do I attach a scraper blade to it, and can I do all this without having to completely rebuild the piston? I mean obviously rebuilding the piston is not out of the question, and obviously I have the lathe and the materials and the mill to do it, but I'd rather not have to do it if I can avoid it. And after having a cup of tea and thinking about the answer for a bit, I've come to the conclusion that the answer to all three of these is yes. And in fact, I'll go a little bit further. I should be able to do all of this in less than a day, and on top of that, it'll be easily reversible, so once I've done my scraping, I can change it back to a reciprocating saw and use it sort of the way that it was intended. So with all that said, let's get started. The first thing I need to do is find a way to reduce the overall stroke length. Now pneumatics aren't exactly something I've worked a whole lot with in the past, but many years ago, you know, long before I did this whole YouTube channel, I made a steam engine with a double acting cylinder. Now obviously it's not a one-to-one -one design, but from memory I was able to use spacers at each end of the cylinder, and that did reduce the stroke. I'm not sure if it's the best approach, but it did work there, and that's what I'm going to attempt to do here. So I'll start off at the lathe with some mystery plastic, which is probably nylon, and I'll turn up some rings which match the diameter of the piston and the diameter of the springs. I ended up turning a few different types and sizes, you know, some fitted in the recessed end of the piston and some fitted in the piston barrel itself, and you know, they all seem to work at reducing the stroke. But what suited me was a 2mm thick ring at the far end of the cylinder. You'll have to work out what works the best for you, but in this instance, it took the stroke down to about 5mm. With that now figured out, I now need to find a way to connect the scraper blade to the end of the piston. As we found out in last week's video, the scraper blade needs to be quite rigidly attached to the scraper so it doesn't move around and flex during use. Now the standard blade holder features a slit for holding the thin blades and then it uses two M8 grub screws to hold it in place. Now you won't have seen this before because it also features a hex sleeve which slides over it and that's also held in place by the grub screws. Now the reason for that is that the front cover has a hex profile and that's used as a guide to keep the piston from rotating during use. Say what you want but I think that's a really simple and well thought out solution to the problem. And instead of trying to rebuild all of that from scratch, I'm going to try and incorporate all of that into my design. So what I'll do is I'll start with a piece of 25mm, you know 1020 steel and I'll get it in the lathe. I'll then clean up the end and then drill a hole in it. This will be for the end of the piston to slide in.
Now the front of the piston measures out to being just over half an inch in diameter, so I'll ream it to half an inch, and to no one's surprise, it doesn't fit. Now sometimes running the reamer in again can get it to open up a little bit, but the hole was still a little bit undersized. It's less than 0.1 of a millimeter to worry about, so I can simply sand it down later. Next, I now need to take the OD down to size. And with it down to size, I can now part it off. With the now parted off, I'll get it in the milling machine and get a hex pattern machined in. And for the overall size, I'm simply just copying the dimensions of the block that came with it. Now the first change that I'll be making is that whilst the hole for the screw is made on the flats on the standard block, I'll only be making one hole here and that's going to be made on the apex. So I'll go the whole way through with the spotting drill and then I'll follow it with an 8mm end mill. I think it's better to do it this way because a twist drill wouldn't have handled this shape as well. I'll then finish it with a counter bore. Now back of the lathe, I'll chuck in the piston, you know, making sure to use soft drills, because we don't want to mark up the piston. I can then sand the shaft down, till it slides into the part we just machined. And with that, we can now get it assembled and do a quick test run. Alright, so far it seems to be looking quite promising. You know, it might be a little bit fast, but I think that might be something that I just have to work around. I might be able to lower it a little bit by reducing the air pressure, but probably not by too much. I'll find out in a little bit, but first I need a way to attach the carbide scraper. Now because the body of the saw is so much smaller than the one that I was working with last week, I can probably get away by just attaching the carbide scraper directly to the front of the piston, pretty much bypassing the need to add a bracket to drop the height, which is what I had to do last week. So what I'll do is I'll take it to the milling machine, put it back in the dividing head, and then I'll machine in a step down and a slot for the carbide blade to sit in and locate in.
All right, and that is the Power Scraper version two all done. And all of that was done in about six or seven hours. You know, that's less than half the time that it took to do the other one. And I'm pretty confident that this one here isn't gonna explode in my face. So let's go ahead and see if it works. Now I've just laid out the bottom using Sharpie, just as a bit of a test run. Alright, I think that needs a little bit of refinement on the carbide blade, but I think this is definitely taking cast iron off. And it's definitely doing it a lot faster and far easier than doing it the old fashioned way. The cut that it's doing is a lot more fine and precise than the power scrapers that I've seen, but I think for what I need, that's probably a good thing. So with the test run now done, I'll go and get my surface plate out, I'll coat it in some layout blue, and then I'll do a quick test run. And looking at the test pattern, the surface is a bit low at each end. So what I'll do now is I'll go in and do my best to scrape away the blue high spots. Now from what I can feel so far, it's taking off less cast iron per pass than it was when I was doing it manually, but it's doing this a lot faster, and overall, even if I have to do another pass or so, it's still doing it a lot faster and a lot easier than doing it manually. Alright, so in total, this took about three passes, and it's already evened it out a lot more than it was before. Now, I might need another pass or so to evenly distribute the contact points, but so far, I am pretty happy with it. You know, in total, this was less than five minutes of work, and that is far quicker and easier than it would be than if I was to do it the old way. So there you go. Overall, I am super happy with how this ended up compared to manually scraping it, and compared to how I was left at the end of last week's video. Overall, this was far cheaper, far quicker, and far easier to design and make than the previous one. And even better still, once I finish scraping, it's literally a two minute job to change it back to use the old block and the old saw blades. And I can promise you that I'll be getting good use out of this as a regular saw. The only thing that I will say just to finish this off is that if you are going to attempt this, it's probably best to use this for smaller work pieces. I think a mill saddle is probably the largest piece that I want to go with before having to move over to a proper power scraper. But for scraping lathes, scraping gibs and scraping vices, this is definitely more than enough. All in all, I'm really happy with this and you're definitely going to see this popping up in a future project, hopefully very soon. And with that, thank you very much for watching, hope you enjoyed this video, see you next week.